Welcome, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming out for the last ECS colloquium for this semester. If you go to our website, we already have the schedule for the beginning of 2017 posted as well. Um, but since the semester is too close, we thought we were going to go out with a bang, a very interesting talk that I see drew a wide audience from many different departments on campus. It's excellent to see. And to introduce our speaker, David Bamman, I'll t uh, turn it over to Eeks and iSchool Professor Marty Hurst. Thanks, Bjorn. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. I'm delighted to introduce David Bamman. He is our very most recent professor in the School of Information. Oh, no, he's not. Actually, we've got a new one. No, it's true, but he's been on sabbatical this semester, so we haven't seen him around. Our penultimately most recent <laughs> professor. Uh, David Bamman's a really interesting guy. He's an interdisciplinary professor. His PhD is in computer science from CMU, but his undergraduate is in classics, and so that I don't get it wrong, I'm going to check my notes. Uh, uh, actually, uh, he works in English classics, linguistics, and Near Eastern studies, his various research areas. But his BA is in classics from Wisconsin. His MA is in applied linguistics from Boston University. And his PhD is in uh, computer science from CMU, as I said. And David's interested in characterizing human social behavior by using a combination of machine learning and natural language processing. And he works at the intersection of computational social science and digital humanities and natural language processing. And his work uncovers insights that challenge conventional understanding of identity by analyzing how it's expressed in language, among other things. Uh, he has actually discovered how to automatically detect censorship in China based on the lack of postings on social media. So he does clever things like that by using big data to understand the world and how we interact with, world, with the world. In another project, he showed how to induce the kinds of characters and characteristic sequence of life events on Wikipedia. Uh, and he's done that to automatically generate biographical summaries. So he's done a lot of really interesting work using analysis. Uh, another thing that I really like about David's work is that he's not wedded to one mathematical technique. So as, uh, uh, just looking at three papers he wrote, uh, it in they included false discovery rate, comparative log likelihood ratios, hierarchical Bayesian models, linear regression, and expectation maximization based probabilistic clustering, just in three papers alone. So it's, it's a really impressive guy. Today he's going to talk about looking at books and book collections. So I give you David Babin. Please give me your attention and your applause. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. <coughs> yeah, so Marty got really all of my biographical details pretty much on the money. Um, my background, my most immediate background is in computer science, though my undergrad degree is in Greek and Latin, master's in linguistics. So a lot of the work that I do right now is really in applying uh, these techniques from machine learning and natural language processing to these domains that I've cared about for a long time. Um, I am delighted to see that there seems to be a mix of interdisciplinary people here. So I'm curious about what this audience composition is. This is Eeks, so I expect that most of you are probably from Eeks. So who here is associated with Eeks in some, some way? OK. Who here comes from a humanities department? OK. So this is maybe about 10. What about social sciences? OK. Also maybe about 10. Uh, professional schools like the iSchool or journalism or public policy? OK. OK, good. So this is great. I'm glad to see this kind of diversity because I want to talk to all of you right now in this room. So I'm glad that you are all here together at the same time. Uh, there are a couple things that I want to do with this talk, aside from just introduce the kind of work that I do to you. The first is uh, essentially try to um, encourage the use, uh, to whet your appetite, really, for the use of books as data for a lot of the kinds of applications that you generally use for machine learning or natural language processing, it's very tempting just to jump to the UCI repositories and get some data sets that just already exist. It's very tempting just to go to Twitter and pull data from their API because it's very easy to do that. Uh, books operate on a different scale entirely. Books are noisy. They're messy. They have problems. You have problems even recognizing what the words are in books. Uh, they have a more complex structure than we often find in really simple tweets and simple text documents, uh, like news stories or web pages. There is a lot of structure that exists in books that, that admits to interesting computational problems. Uh, and a lot of the challenges that we think of when we, think, when, we, when we approach books from the computational side 
And I think it makes sense to think about them as being opportunities as well. So one of these is just simply how long books are, how long the sentences are, are really uh, challenging things from a lot of natural language processing viewpoints. But at the same time, the fact that books are long gives us a lot more information to deal with. So there's a lot more uh, information that we can have for, for understanding what's in a book uh, than we would have for other sort of smaller text documents. Um, the other thing is that then, uh, there's a lot of great work that's being done right now at the intersection of machine learning and natural language processing and the humanities, in this area of computational humanities or digital humanities. And one of the things that I want to expose here for people who are doing work at this intersection is that if you're taking tools that have been really optimized for very narrow domains like news and just apply them directly out of the box to books, you're going to encounter a lot of problems which are going to be swept under the rug unless you're aware of those implicit biases there. So in the course of, of talking about the, what we can do with books, I want to really also highlight the challenges that we have in still understanding what are in the books themselves because in many ways the kind of techniques that you would use for, for uh, anal analyzing books need to be adopted, uh, adapted to, to, the, to the, the specific peculiarities that they have. Uh, I want to, before we get too deep, I want to talk about or introduce who my collaborators are for all this work that I will be talking about today. Uh, Ted Underwood is a professor of English at the University of Illinois. Cody Hennessy is a librarian here in Doe Library. Uh, John Gillick and Michelle Carney are both grad students at the School of Information. And uh, I want to especially highlight the, the contributions that a lot of undergraduate students from EECS have made in these projects. Uh, this includes Serena Jung, Jennifer Lin, uh, Laura McConaughey, Smith & Million, and Vijeta Shridhar. Uh, all of these students, I, I'm a very strong advocate for pushing research as far into the undergraduate curriculum as we can. And I think all of these students have really exemplified this in really amazing ways. Uh, either getting papers that are published in NLP conferences or just doing the research that is going to result in some publication down the road. So a lot of this work that I'm going to be talking about today is due to all these people, but especially the undergrads who have been working on this over the past year. Okay, so let's jump into this. This is a book. How many of you have read a book in the past month or so? Okay, so more than half. This is, this is more than I thought. This is not meant to be a shaming question. I haven't read a book myself in about two or three months. So I'm not, I'm not judging from a position of, uh, of judgment here. Uh, but I think it's important to, to point out what, these, what books are in the first place. Books are material things. When we think about books from the perspective of text analysis, it's tempting just to think about them as being strings of words, or strings of, or just strings, long strings generally. Uh, but books are much more complex than that. They have a materiality, right? They have a weight. They have a dimension. They have lots of other components to them aside from the text themselves. So this here is the edition of The Poems of John Keats by William Morse, published in 1894 by the Kelmscott Press. William Morse is a famous arts and crafts uh, author and, and designer. And it really uh, gives you an, a sense of what books look like when you pay attention to the craft of bookmaking. Right, so it's not just the text that's, that's important here. It's the fact that there's a lot of other things that surrounds the text that makes the book what this is, what a book is. Um, if we're talking about the kinds of books that we have access to computationally, we are now in a position at the end of about 10 years of Google essentially going into university libraries and scanning everything, that we have a lot of books that we can reason with right now. So the public facing side of, of Google, the Google Digitization Project is the Hadi Trust, uh, which also incorporates a lot of information from the Internet Archive, which has made headlines the past couple of days and making sure it relocates part of its operation to Canada to make sure it's preserved in the transition of presidency. Um, but with the, with the Hadi Trust, we have access as researchers to about 15 million books. And these range in their publication date from the dawn of printing uh, to the pretty much today. Uh, Five and a half million of these books are in the public domain. And that practically means that they were published before 1923. There are some books that, that leak in after, this, after that date, but for the most part, pragmatically, what public domain means is before 1923. Um, I want to point out that by being affiliated with the University of California, you have access to all of these books. So if you want to go to the Hadi Trust website, send them an email saying what you want to do with those books, you can get access to all these public domain books right now. Just download all these. They, they will whitelist your IP address, and you can R-sync all of them. Uh, all of them in the, in the public domain, anyway. Um, now, the, the promise here of books that are of this size is the large-scale analysis of culture. Right? Now, culture is this very nebulous term. And we have to uh, uh, 
put a lot of caveats here by culture as is defined by that recorded and published books. So it excludes people, for example, who are not able to publish their ideas. Uh, it also, and we also have the caveat here of culture as it's preserved in university libraries. Right, so it's not the kind of you can imagine the kind of books that we have by going down to the Berkeley Public Library and scanning everything there is going to be a very different representative sample of culture than the books that we have in the university library. It's a very different kind of represent, representative uh, sample than we would get by digitizing all of the books that are sold most popularly on Amazon, for example. Um, some of you may know, know this uh, Google Ngram viewer, which came out in 2010, which gives you uh, an interface for searching for specific terms through a large collection of their digitized books. So an example of this would be to search for fascism and see how it peaks in the, at the end of World War II and maybe with Vietnam and, um, and so on. Now, with uh, the Google Ngram viewer, we essentially have a very simplistic representation, very simplistic access to the information that's encoded in all of these books. Uh, and it's subject to a couple of different constraints. On the one hand, it's a very simple interface. Right? You just get to have access to the information of the frequency of words over the course of about 200 years, reliably. Uh, we also have the problem, as Jeff Nunberg pointed out in an in a, uh, influential article after the Google Ngram Bureau came out in 2010, that a lot of the metadata we have that describes those books is errorful. For, for lots of different reasons. We can't always trust the date of publication for books. And a lot of this is due to the fact that the, the metadata we get comes from the individual university libraries. So as the librarians make mistakes uh, in terms of their cataloging, we, those errors are propagated through these sort of digitization efforts as well. Um, uh, which is not to cast shade on librarians. They're, they're doing a very important job in doing all this. It just speaks to the fact that when we collect a lot of information from very disparate places, a lot of noise is just introduced by that fact, that there are very different kinds of cataloging schemes and different ways of classifying these, uh, these kinds of metadata data points that allow us to, to, to have this kind of noise creep into these systems uh, overall. Um, what I want to do with this talk here is give you a couple of case studies of the kinds of things that we can do with large scale data in book form when we have access to the actual raw text of the books themselves and are not limited just to the interface of searching for individual search terms, but rather having access to the entire text and information about that text that's reliable in some way. So we'll give you two case studies of the, the, the the use of character in literary novels, both from a perspective of simply descriptive statistics and what that can tell us in a very powerful setting, also a model-based approach to what we can learn about character as it's presented overall in books. I'll also talk about three areas of computational work that are in progress right now in, um, among the, my, my research group that look at the ways in which uh, we can uh, drive a low-level analysis of these kinds of corpora that can enable the kind of higher-level analysis that you want to get at when you approach these questions of culture. So to jump right in here to these quite cases of character in book data, um, if we start from the, this, the, the standing point that we can represent literary characters in books, in literary text, through uh, an articulation of the kinds of things that they do, the kinds of things that they have done to them, uh, the kinds of objects that they possess, and the adjectives and nouns that are predicated as being true of that person. What we can do here is essentially give us a way of representing what a character is in some literary novel. And if we do this, so this here draws on information about syntactic parsing for in the natural language processing community to, to, to characterize characters, to characterize the people who exist in text by these characteristic things, by the kinds of things they do, the kinds of things they have done to them, and so on. Now, if we simply add up all of these actions that characters take in novels, what we can get at here is a level of the attention that is given to characters in those novels. Right? If you just simply count up all the actions that, it, that Tom Sawyer does in Tom Sawyer, you have a measure of how much of that text space is given to Tom Sawyer. And there are other ways we can operationalize this. We could just count up how many words that Tom Sawyer speaks and have that be a way of uh, measuring the overall attention. We can count up the number of times that Tom Sawyer is mentioned by name and have that be another measure of attention. But all of these things give us a way of operationalizing how much attention overall is given to one character in one novel. Now, if we look over time and plot how much of the attention in a novel is given to characters who are women, versus characters who are men, just a very simple descriptive statistic 
of these book corpora, a subset of these corpora that are just literary novels, what we get at here is a really powerful result. If we facet this by who the authors are, whether or not the authors themselves are women or men, what we find is that over the course of 200 years, there's a relatively stable distribution in the attention that women give to other female characters. That overall, of the attention of an entire book, that women as authors give equal attention to male and female characters. Now, there's some variation here in that you see that there's a slight dip between 1950 and 1970 that's corrected with what we might postulate as third-wave feminism. Um, the important story to be told here, though, is not the variation that exists over time, but the variation that exists as a function of who the author is, of the gender of the author. Because what we find here is that when we compare the allocation of attention to women and men among male and female authors, we see a striking disparity. Now, women as authors give relatively equal attention to both male and female characters, while men as authors give three times as much attention to male characters as they do to female characters. Yeah? Is this normalized by genre? This is only looking at fiction. But overall within fiction. No, fiction. O overall within all of fiction. So it's possible there are, there are topical compounds here. But overall, when you talk about the, the kinds of fiction stories that are in university libraries, it is shocking that this difference is so great. Now, I've done work in uh, how uh, women are characterized in Wikipedia, for example. And I know that the biases that exist that as a function of the lack of women editors percolates up to how women are characterized in biographies of Wikipedia. Uh, I um, know how, uh, I've done work on how women and men present their gender on Twitter and know there are very striking differences in there as well. Uh, we would expect to have a difference here. Right. This is also text that exists in the real world where there are all these biases. But the fact that this difference is so strong is to me a shocking result. Uh, and it's simply one that we can get by just having access to the full text of the books, having a way of operationalizing our attention given to character, and then fastening that by information about the metadata about who the author is. So having access to all this information can lead us to really powerful results using very simple techniques of just counting. Right, of just counting, we can get to these these these, uh, these kinds of insights. Now, from a more, uh, and we actually see this. We know that this this kind of trend is um, is real because we see it corrected for in other types of fiction. So, fan fiction here is another genre of contemporary fiction that is stories that are told in the vein of another of a canon of another story. So, a new story written in the past five years that is about the same characters in Jane Eyre, for example. The characters do different things, they interact in different ways, different characters are highlighted from each other. And what we see in fan fiction stories, when we compare a fan fiction story to its original story and measure the differences in the attention that are given to different characters, what we find is that fan fiction allocates less attention to the main protagonist and more attention to secondary characters, right? So if you're talking about Sherlock Holmes, you want to see what happens to Watson more because you already know what happens to Sherlock Holmes. It's already there in the main story. Part of what's, uh, what's great about the genre is this kind of variation that's expressed and, and seeing alternative realities. What we also see in this collection is that there's much more attention being paid to female characters than there are to male characters. And in part, we might interpret this as being a correction to the natural biases that we've already seen in fiction overall. That part of the reason why we see more attention given to female characters here is simply that there is not that much attention given to female characters overall when we, when we don't correct for who the author is. So this here, again, relies only on simple counting methods. We can also think about more complex ways of approaching uh, um, the, the, the information in a book in a more holistic sense, it's still also in the topic of character, by plotting them in the, in the context of a probabilistic model that can learn what clusters of characters operate like over the course of a lot of different books. And the idea here is that we can, we can cluster different characters together through the process of entity type inference by defining essentially a way uh, of, of articulating how it is that characters behave in similar ways, how characters who exhibit the same sort of information for the kinds of, th for the kinds of actions that they, that they execute, um, how those are, are, are tend to be in common. So in relying on this, we're still relying on uh, this idea of articulating character as being a combination of the kinds of actions that characters perform, have done to them, the kinds of things they possess, and the kinds of adjectives and nouns that are predicated of them. If we calculate, if we uh, define an entity type here as being a probabilistic distribution over these kinds of type syntactic representations, then what we can define here as a persona or an entity type is exactly what these distributions look like. 
that a zombie for persona, for example, may be defined by being the agent of verbs like kill and eat, but is not themselves eaten. They are themselves killed, but not eaten. So this distinction between what the kinds of things that an entity character does and the kinds of things that they have done to them is very important. Right? Preserving this syntactic and semantic distinction that we get from parsing um, is important for how we operationalize what an entity type means. Um, now, in trying to, ent to learn what a set of coherent entity or character types look like in the course of a lot of novels in, uh, in this kind of data set, we can use the machinery of probabilistic graphical models, where we're essentially saying, so I, I assume that many of you are probably familiar with the machinery of graphical models, but if you're not, if you're coming from the humanities or social sciences, the basic idea here is that if we articulate a set of variables, some of them that we some of them we observe, some of them we don't observe, and these can be words, it can be the, the latent identity of a character type. Uh, if we posit the statistical dependencies that exist between those variables, then essentially the problem of inference in graphical models is reversing the reverse engineering the values that we don't see of those variables that we don't see from the values of the variables that we do, according keeping in mind the structure of the conditional independencies that exist between these variables. Now, if we articulate this in the context of a model for uh, learning character types in novels, the only thing we ever actually observe here are the syntactic dependencies that are obtaining for a particular character. We only ever observe these things as truly observable variables. What we can say here when our assumption is that the things that the words that we observe are themselves directly generated as draws from a multinomial distribution conditioned on a latent topic that we don't see. So, so any of you who are familiar with topic models, uh, this notion of a latent topic is something that's borrowed from, from that literature as well. Uh, what we'll say here with a latent character type is a distribution over these kinds of type syntactic dependencies. So that if we know what the true entity type is for a character, like Tom Sawyer, that he co corresponds to a wily, rascally kid, then if we knew that aspect about him, it would make the fact of us observing the specific words that we see with him a lot more likely. And it's that principle that drives a lot of this machinery of graphical models of explaining why it is that we see the data that we do see and not different data that we did not see. So, uh, if we treat a latent variable here as being this entity, we'll also then draw this uh, from a model that can, from a distribution that can condition on the uh, aspects of metadata for the book itself. Now, this could be the date that the book was published. Uh, if we have reason to believe that different entity types were more or less prominent in different historical eras, but one thing that we we'll can include here is information about who the author is. That maybe Dickens has a bunch of different entity, different character types that you expect to see in a lot of his novels. You expect to see in Oliver Twist uh, a, a chimney sweep that also persists with that persists in different kinds of novels. So, if we have a way of operationalizing that of Saying that information about who the author is gives us information about the likely entity types that we expect to see in a novel, then this is one way that we can do that. And we'll have, repeat this process once for every character type in a book and once for every, um, uh, for every novel that we have in our collection. And the assumptions behind all of this is that all of the words that we have associated with a character are essentially explained by their type. Right, so the way that the assumptions work in this model, which are directly legible from uh, the articulation of the dependencies between these variables, is that all of the words that we see down here are always mediated only through who the type is. The fact that Tom Sawyer is a wily rascal explains everything that we see about all the words that appear on his page. Now, this works great for, um, for movies, right? So I have uh, worked in this and trying to infer character types in movies where we've learned very clear distinctions between the male, uh, the canonical male action hero that is defined by being the, the syntactic agent, the, the subject and semantic agent of verbs like shoot and interrogate and kill. It becomes a lot more complex in novels because novels have this problem of stylistic, this opportunity of stylistic heterogeneity that one of the things that we can observe here is that if you take two different novels, one by James Fenimore Cooper, one by Mark Twain, that if you look at the kinds of words that are associated with different characters in those novels, part of what we see as being uh, a re reason for the difference has nothing to do with character at all. It has something to do only with the fact that James Fenimore Cooper uses words of historical English like thou and thy, and Mark Twain uses slang terms, the Mississippi slang terms like ain't. So part of the reason for, part of what unsupervised models do generally in, in, in these kinds of settings is rely on the fact that there is variation in the observations that you have. And using this, leveraging that structure that exists in that variation to learn the fact that there are different clusters, different, inherently different mixtures 
uh, that generated the variation that we see. If the variation that we see in these two different cases is due only to the fact that the authors are different, that means that we will essentially learn that there are only characters who are James Fenimore Cooper characters, who all behave the same because they all use words like thou and thy. And those are all very different characters than the ones that we would see from Mark Twain because Mark Twain's characters never use those terms. Right, so if what we will actually care about is learning a Dickensian character or learning a Twainian character, then the last model would be an appropriate model to use. But if what we want to do here is control for the fact that there is variation that exists in the text that we observe, we need to have a different model that can do that. And one way that we can leverage here, one uh, idea that we can leverage here, is this idea of maximum entropy language models, which is an old idea that dates back to uh, Ronnie Rosenfeld's work in the 90s, but it's seeing a resurgence now, resurgence now in a lot of neural language modeling that can essentially condition a lot of different contextual variables about the author, about the background, about the context in which a message is uttered. And the idea here is that rather than operationalizing the probability of a word as being drawn from a flat multinomial, we will include other, other external effects, which can, which can either be latent in the context of an entity type, or they can be observed in the context of metadata about the author. So rather than having um, the probability of a word being driven entirely by a latent entity type, we can have some of the rationale be due only to the fact that the author was Mark Twain, or the author was James Fenimore Cooper. So we're essentially discounting that information and learning the kinds of character types that we have. And if we do this, essentially what we're doing here is just moving the operationalization of where the metadata comes in away from the choice of influencing the, the top level entity types and more towards influencing the probabilities of the words that we see. And if we do this, uh, and, but, uh, so in other ways, the assumption that's baked in here is that all of the words that we have associated with a character are explained either by their persona, their entity type, or by the author, right? It can be one of these two different things that's responsible for seeing the data that we actually have. And if we do this, uh, if we ha well, so in doing this, I worked with a literary scholar who articulated a couple of different hypotheses to try and tease apart what these different uh, models were learning. And one of these is in trying to distinguish between uh, hypotheses of different kinds. One of these is the, the hypothesis that two different characters from the same author should be more similar to each other for a subset of characters and authors than they are to a distractor, author from, a distractor character from a different author. So the idea here is that we want uh, two characters um, from, from, in, from uh, Jane Austen novels to be more similar to each other from, than a character in a specific uh, Charlotte Bronte novel. And these are not random characters. These are, these are characters that a literary scholar deems should be more similar to each other than, than they are to a distractor. And what we find here is that a model that can essentially encode the similarity of characters as being a function of who the author is, that presses characters to be the same if their authors are the same, does, of course, does in fact do better at, at making these hypotheses correct than a model that, uh, that essentially discounts for that kind of information. On the other hand, if our hypothesis is that there are some characters that, from the same author, that we want to be more similar to each other than to another distractor character, also from that author, but perhaps from a different book, like uh, Pride and Prejudice here versus The Sense of Sensibility, then we expect a model that can essentially control for the fact of uh, the author's influence here to be able to discriminate better at those characters. And that's what we find, in fact, when we do this, uh, when we include the metadata at the level of predicting the probability of the word rather than predicting the probability of the overall persona type. <laughs> so, point being with all of this here, with these two model-based approach, is that descriptive statistics are great for, for bringing out what the important components are of these kinds of large data sets. But we can also adopt another more principled modeling approach uh, that can also learn really interesting things about this kind of data that can drive other literary questions that people in the humanities uh, um, find, find valuable. But having different modeling assumptions here for these two different kinds of models allow us to capture different aspects of character that encode that essentially are according with different literary assumptions as well, whether or not there should be Dickensian characters or whether or not there should not, whether we want to have these character types that appeal across different kinds of domain. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting work that's being done in the computational humanities that, that leverages really large data of this kind. Uh, this here is a selection of work that uh, I'll only point out what the, what the themes are and who the authors are to give you a sense of what good work looks like in this area. But it's not just work on character, like I've discussed right now. It's work on genre, work on the emotions of text, work on the loudness of novels. Uh, so whether or not the people who are, uh, in, who are uh, involved in dialogue are shouting or whispering uh, and so on. <clears throat> uh, uh, measuring the allocation of attention to different geographical areas in, uh, in North America after the Civil War, before the Civil War. 
uh, looking at uh, general discussions of themes and literary diction and text, there's a lot of great work being done in this area that is using these kind of large scale digital collections of books right now. Uh, <clears throat> I want to point out a couple of different areas that really need to be, have some advancements made before we can trust some of these results, though. And I'll talk about three different areas briefly. Uh, one of these is just in core natural language processing. So a lot of NLP has really been optimized for very narrow domains of news. Uh, for the past 30 years, it's been news. For the past five years, we've seen an increasing interest in social media generally. So there's more uh, attention being made in NLP right now to those areas. Um, uh, there's uh, problems that we need to co confront in terms of the metadata of these books. What we actually know about the books themselves in terms of their language, in terms of their date of publication, in terms of their date of composition. In many cases, what we know about the book is often wrong or it's misspecified for the thing that we care about. Right? So in many cases, the date of publication is fine, but it's often not the same thing as the date of composition, which we actually is the thing that we really need to know. And we'll also talk about the document structure in books. So books are, are complex things. They're not just generic text. They have structure. And having a, a way of segmenting out what these different texts look like is important for being able to understand what components of the text we're using in order to, to make our analysis from. Um, and I'll talk about three, uh, just touch on three different areas of, of con current work right now that's very much in progress by me and my students, uh, both for uh, dependency parsing of literary text, of predicting the date of composition for these texts, and in segmenting the internal structure of a book. So let me try to start with, with, uh, with the last one first. But all of these are really following the standard supervised methodology. Where what we're doing here is essentially designing a categorization system, uh, labeling data according to that categorization system, training some model, and then using that trained model to predict the values that we don't see. And in many cases, the hard work here is not in the choice of a specific algorithm in these supervised cases, where there's often not a very big distinction between logistic regression or support vector machine, for example. But there's a really big distinction in how it is we choose to formulate the research question in the first place. And this is where a lot of this work of interacting with people who come from the humanities and social sciences is really crucial for driving this work forward. Because this is the step that is most important to get right from the very beginning. Or you need to be able, before we start annotating data, before we start formulating what the problem is in the first place, having discussions about what makes sense, what makes sense as a real problem, is the important uh, part for driving this work forward. So I'll talk about, uh, and that includes designing, and this work in, includes in particular, designing the correct date of publication for a specific book, designing the best categorization system for, for that book too, and designing the best syntactic parts for a sentence, when there is an inher inherently a lot of ambiguity in these kinds of literary texts as well. Okay, so let me jump into this problem of segmentation. Um, books are complex things, right? They're not just strings of words. They're not just strings of letters. Uh, they have title pages. They have dedications. They have prefaces. They have tables of contents. They have the actual content of the book itself. They have indices, right? All of these are different components of these books that, that uh, deserve different kinds of attention uh, being allocated to them. They also have, uh, if you look back into these kind of historical books, there are a lot of other kinds of sections of books that we don't often see in books being read anymore. Part of that includes advertisements, right? So if you're interested here in the history of botany, you may also be interested in a manual of surgery for seven pence or seven shillings, and maybe also a lexicon pharmacoidum for nine shillings. This shows up in the back of the history of botany. It shows up in the back of a lot of these sort of historical books that um, are no different from books right now where you see other, other, other titles in the series by a publisher. Those are advertisements too. So the problem here that we're facing is to take a sequence of pages in a book and try to predict a sequence of page categories, where essentially what we're learning here is just a mapping between our representation of the page and one of the categories that we think are of value to us for analysis. And the hard part here is, in part, one of the hard parts here is deciding what these categorization system looks like that is most appropriate for these kinds of historical books. Um, the one that we've ended up settling on here uh, tries to distinguish between title pages, copyright pages, dedications, tables of contents, prefaces, uh, the actual content of the book itself, uh, appendices, the index, advertisements, and everything else. So everything else includes blank pages, it includes the title pages of microforms, and so on. Um, so essentially what we've uh, done so far is annotated, manually annotated 200 books for a total of about 48,000 pages, according to their categorization into these different categories. Um, we have a couple of different forms of evidence that we can use to leverage in this case. We have uh, reason to believe that the actual words in, on the page themselves will be good indicators of the categories. So if we see the word preface on a page, it's a 
good signal that it might be a preface. Um, and the information about the position of the book is also important. So knowing that the a table of contents shows up within the, within the first 10% of the book is important for labeling it as, as such and not at the very end. Knowing the count of the words, knowing the count of the numbers of, of numbers on those pages is also could be an important thing for distinguishing between some of these different categories. So on the one hand, we have lots of handcrafted features that we can use to bring to bear in making these kind of cat classifications. We also have the layout of the page itself. Right? So in many cases, even just glancing at the structure of an index page or a table of contents page is enough for us as humans to know that it is a table of contents and not without knowing at all what the words are. So if you look at a table of contents in, in other languages, you probably have had this, um, this phenomenon of knowing exactly that it is a table of contents page, even if you don't know what any of the words actually mean. So we have two sources of information that we can use to make these kind of classifications. And we can encode those into a feed-forward neural network that reasons about them in two different ways. So either including uh, these uh, indicators of the handcrafted features, which are, is a very sparse matrix, most of which made up of simple binary indicators for whether or not a word is present, uh, but also information about the relative ratio of where the page shows up in the, in the document, how many, uh, the count of number of words, count of number of numbers that it has, and also an, an input side that involves a convolution of the actual page image itself. And I, in this case here, we're not talking about the actual physical page, but the representation of the bounding box of the coordinates of the words that the OCR program recognized that we get also from these, uh, these large scale collections. So I, I, I didn't point out that what we get from these collections are the image data, the OCR data, and also the OCR bounding box information. So that provides us with a simplification of where the interesting stuff is on a page without us having to reason about the entire image overall, which also involves the hard problem of actually doing the, the, the difficult OCR uh, uh, problem itself. So if we run this model with the, in a tenfold cross-validation, this is standard feed forward neural network that we train with stochastic gradient descent and dropout. If you run this on in a tenfold cross-validated uh, um, cross um, a test on all the total of 42,000 pages, what we find here is that we're able to recognize the title pages, the indices, and the table of contents with reasonably good F-scores here, rever averaging about 0.5. Now, it's, we could present just the accuracy scores, but because the number of con the, the content pages account for essentially 90% of a book, most of the book are content pages, having a, a, a measure of how well we're getting at everything else that we might care about uh, is important. And what we find here is that both of these different sides of the information contribute to the, the accuracy, sco accuracy scores that we get overall. So if we do an ablation test and use only the handcrafted features, we see a drop in the reduction. These are the macro uh, precision recall and F scores that average over all the different precision and recall scores for those different individual categories. We see a, a slight reduction if we take out the image data and just use the, the information about the sparse uh, words that we have, the location of the, the, the page and the book overall. Uh, and if we take out all of those handcrafted features and just use the image side, the accuracy drops significantly. But importantly, the important the thing that you want to take away from all of this is that the overall accuracy, the best accuracy here, really involves the, both sides of the equation, both sides of these different kinds of inputs, which gives us reason to hope that there's uh, much more interesting work that we can do going forward that leverages this as not just a standard feed-forward neural network that treats every classification decision as being made in isolation, but rather can treat this as a real sequence labeling problem where we use information about the, the pages that come before as information for the likeliest label for the current page that we're predicting. So an LSTM is, 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 um, is in the works right now. Um, okay, so. That's the problem of composition, um, uh, sorry, the problem of segmentation. The problem of uh, dating here, I'll only go through quickly because I see I'm running quite short of time. Uh, but the problem here of dating is this issue uh, that if what we care about is a large scale analysis of trends that happen over 200 years of historical time, one issue that we often encounter is the fact that the dates of publication that we have for a book don't actually correspond to when the book was written. So if I am treating all of Jane Austen's works as being indicative of when Jane Austen lived, this is actually a real problem. Because you'll see here that the mode of Jane Austen's publications is around the turn of the century, around 1900. Jane Austen died in 1816 or so. So 100 years later, her books are still being thought of as being emblematically Jane Austen. And if we treat them as being representative of, of 1900, then we're going to have a really strong bias here in what we think 1900 looks like. 
Um, so the problem here that we're treating is rather than accepting the, the date of publication as given by the metadata, what we'll do is try to predict when the book was first composed. We don't ever actually know when the book was first composed. So what we're going to try and do here is predict the date of first publication. Uh, and you might think that this is a relatively easy problem if we have a really big document collection. We just find all the duplicates and then just take the very first one. But it, uh, in two cases, it depends on the size of the data collection itself. So if you have a really small collection or if you have even a big collection, there are a lot of books that just aren't going to be in there. Um, so that in the case of Jane Austen, for example, there were very few, if any of them, that were actually around when she first published the book, around 1823 or so. Um, so the, the problem that we're going to have here is predicting this data of composition using, again, manually created data that we've labeled. So in doing this, we've labeled three 1,000 book samples uh, from the public domain data from the Hathi Trust from different kinds of samples of the data. Uh, the uniform random sample of all books in the data overall, a uniform random sample from just the fiction, and a sample that's stratified by decade. And for every book, what we're going to do here is try to identify what its earliest date of publication is, or treat it as being un undateable in the first place. Um, and this is actually a hard problem. Trying to decide what, what counts as being the first date of publication for books is not as trivial of a task as you might think it is. Because there are a lot of problems like translations, right? If you have um, an example of a, of a translation, is the date of publication, the date of first publication of it, the translation that was made or the original date? It depends entirely on what your research question is that you want to have this for later on. Uh, serials also have this problem. Uh, heavily edited material, abridgments, compilations, these stories of Aesop's fables were certainly not published in uh, 1876 or whatever this was, uh, it originally, depending on how we choose to, to articulate it. Um, and we can also ask, well, after we've labeled this data, what we can ask is if this question is, is even meaningful in the first place. Do we actually even need to care that the date of publication that we have is different from the date of, public, the date of composition that we're assigning by hand? And what we find here is that about 70% of books in the collection overall have exactly the same date. So it's exactly the same date of publication as was the date of first publication that we've identified. About 10% of books have dates that are at least 10 years apart. 5% of books have dates that are about 25 years apart. And about just under 1% of books have dates that are over 100 years apart. So again, it depends entirely on what you want to use this kind of data for. But having just manual labels of what exactly these differences are gives us a sense of, of, of whether or not it really matters. We have the empirical information now to make this assessment for ourselves. And if we treat this um, as a problem of prediction, Again, using uh, cross-validation for some subset of the train data, uh, we can have different ways of choosing to represent what the books are. And what we find, though, is that if we try to make a prediction for what that first publication date was, if we take the baseline to be the average publication, the average first publication date in our training set, the, the mean absolute error for this baseline would be 30 years. Right? So you just guess the average value. You get, you'd be wrong 30 years on average. If you use information about the author birth and death dates to bound the, the, the likely dates that you think a book would be published, that gets you down to about 22. If you use uh, duplicate document, uh, document uh, detection here to try to find other books that are the same and take the earliest publication date of them as being your prediction for what the date of composition was, that gets it down to about eight years. Uh, if you include, include unigrams, it doesn't help at all because you're essentially already learning all this from the similar docs anyway. It just adds noise. But uh, the, uh, the, the takeaway here, though, is that none of these methods actually works better than predicting the date of publication on its own. So this gives us an average mean absolute error of about five years. So this is a negative result. This is hard to do, hard to predict the date of first publication using any features from the book itself, using any features uh, about the metadata, about who the author comes from, or even collection level information. None of these yet are able to beat a prediction that predicts essentially what the date of, first pub the date of publication that you have in the metadata. This is a hard task. Um, OK, I will skip through some of this and just wrap up briefly by saying that the other big problem of NLP right now is that a lot of the methods that we have for syntax really have been optimized for the newswire as encoded in the Wall Street Journal. Because this is what the, the largest collection of syntactically annotated data that we have available to us comes from this source. If we use it to try to parse something like Paradise Lost, uh, we go into really, it ends up being it, it exposed in really terrible ways. Uh, this here is long as the way in hard that out of hell leads up to light that essentially gets a syntactic parse that is equivalent to Jesus is the way in the same way that long is the way here because we misrecognize long as being a noun in the first place and not the adjective that it, it is in, the, in, in, in reality in Milton's text. 
So what we see that, that in many cases, in a lot of different tasks in NLP, if we use data that's trained on the Wall Street Journal to predict text for either par parts, of parts of speech, phrase structure, grammar, uh, name entity recognition, dependency parsing, and the like, across genres, accuracy tanks. It always tanks, right? By, by really dramatic measures, uh, upwards of, of 50 points when you, when you compare Middle English with the Wall Street Journal. Um, and we know that the really easy solution to this is just to have in-domain training data, right? So if we train a model uh, on the Wall Street Journal, use it to predict parts of speech on Twitter, it does poorly uh, when you do that domain, uh, across those domains. But if you train natively on Twitter, you get, you, it becomes a lot better. Uh, same thing happens for early modern German text, same thing happens for uh, Middle English text. But if you actually train on data that is in the domain, this is the best way of getting actually good accuracy here, right? So you don't have to rely necessarily on really complex domain adaptation algorithms. What you need to have is in-domain training data. So what we've also been doing here is manually labeling a lot of literary texts for their syntactic dependency parse. And at this point, we have about 35,000 words annotated from a selection of novels of different dates, uh, different genres, different dates, I mean, Goebbels Travels, Wuthering Heights, Moby Dick, Treasure Island, uh, Sons and Lovers, uh, and, and so on. And what we see here is that having the access to this information first allows us to quantify how poorly these methods are doing if you train only on the Wall Street Journal and use it to parse Gulliver's Travels. The labeled accuracy score for dependency parsing here, uh, using data trained from the WebTree Bank, drops about 15 points. And this is also true for all these different texts that we've uh, evaluated this on. Sons and Lovers, Wuthering Heights, Moby Dick, and Treasure Island. But if we start training again on those native texts themselves, we see those accuracy scores go up. They're not quite to the level of having the, the, the native annotations of the Web Tree Bank, but including information about just training on other literary texts boosts the accuracy of about five, uh, five points including information about the actual text that you want to parse, like Gulliver's Travels or Sons and Lovers, and boost that accuracy a little bit more, and including some information about the actual, the, the literally large corpus, has a marginal effect uh, that doesn't seem to be that great in comparison to the gains that you get from actually having in-domain data that uh, you train these parsers on natively. So there's a ton of work, there's a lot of space here to be done in domain adaptation for making these models uh, closer to the, the upper bounds that we would get from training natively on the domains that have much larger corpora. But um, I'll just point out that there's a lot more work that needs to be done here. And there's a lot more work generally that needs to be done in a lot of this space. I've given you a, a couple of different dimensions to go on in terms of the core NLP task, in terms of document structure task, in terms of trying to predict the metadata that's suitable for the analysis, I would add that there's a lot of other kinds of questions that would be interesting in books as well, including these issues of materiality, about what the books are about, the colors in the books. But I see that I only have, with only four minutes, why don't we just take questions? So thank you. Was it you mentioned the data you have includes the bounding boxes yeah. for uh, for the OCR? Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent is is there also um, a body of, of work and a researchers looking at what that says about the graphic design and the typography of books? Yeah, so this is exactly what I wanted to get at when we talk about the materiality of books as being really interesting research questions. Uh, no, there, there is no work. I know this space pretty well, and I don't know of anybody who's doing that kind of work in this kind of domain. Uh, typography is one of the most interesting questions that you could use in these kinds of in these kind of data sets because you have data of such variety of, of such different printing presses um, that it naturally is going to be of interest of, of how these kinds of fonts evolve over time. Uh, Taylor Burke Kirkpatrick, who was here, did, did and is doing interesting work in OCR for these kinds of texts that includes information about the typography and the printing presses. Uh, but I don't know of any work that's actually doing analysis on the actual fonts and typographies and the layout themselves. Yeah, it's a great direction though. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of shocked at the uh, difficulties you've indicated. Uh, I know that, uh, for example, we have um, uh, computer vision mm -hmm. uh, trying to interpret images. Yep. I say, oh, that's really hard. Yep. I, I say, well, text, that's got to be really easy to text. But you've indicated that it's not easy, yep. uh, that uh, even the English or the meaning of the terms, it changes. I mean, what's wrong with the Wall Street Journal? <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't that match up to other English? Right. Well, I think the problem is that language is a complex thing, right? And we have these, pro these, 
um, these things of, of, of dialects and domains and idiolects where it's a very expressive medium that is often tailored to the kinds of audiences that you expect to be heard. So the having, it's not, it's not a uniform distribution of, you wouldn't expect to have the same kind of language in these different settings, and we simply observe this fact um, over and over again in different kinds of application areas of NLP. I will point out that, yes, image processing generally in computer vision is generally very hard, but all of NLP is predicated on the fact that text is also really hard, generally. You have presented some really interesting and sophisticated algorithms to get data out of books and then also compared, you know, the, um, the accuracy or so that's underlying. You can have given us one interesting findings that came out of that, and that's, you know, that male and female authors, you know, pay different attention to women. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a couple of other insights uh, of similar importance that you may have found in, in this research? So in this work, no. I mean, the only work that I've done in terms of the analysis side has been on looking at questions of gender and the distribution <coughs> of gender over time. Um, uh, the result, the works that we have, the uh, analysis that we've done for looking at character types over over the course of these uh, 200 years in these books hasn't been uh, hasn't resulted in any like shocking analyses in the same way that you would expect for for gender. Um, so not no, not yet. That is still. I mean, this is the the point of doing all this work, though. So this is all still on the table. I had a question about where you think that we as a community should be dedicating our time. So if, if these domain, uh, tagged domain data does so much better, but at the same time, tagging domain data takes an incredible amount of time, and mm -hmm. that in itself is actually not always super accurate. Tag yeah. data can be completely inaccurate depending yeah. on who's doing the tagging. Yeah. So do you think that we, to be getting better insights out of these, these data, should we be spending our time tagging domain data and doing that across domains, or should we be spending more time making kind of these more generalizable and maybe unsupervised methods like deep learning, TensorFlow, make those more applicable to any domain so that we won't have to rely on these horribly, often inaccurate tag data. Yeah. So just like, where should we as a community be spending our time? Yeah. So this is often, you know, the promise of a lot of unsupervised learning is that you, and in deep learning in particular, is that you don't have to spend as much time annotating data that you can, if you have a large body of, of, of text or generic data, that you can learn what the interesting features are and have those drive the decisions you make down the road. I think in practice, we don't really see that in text. That it's, it's a good tool to have in terms of understanding the, the large scale structure that exists in data. But it's not always going to be a substitute for having the precision of knowing exactly the kind of, of, of category that you're predicting. Um, in many cases, you can use it to generate un features that are good for a, a later downstream supervised task. Um, but having a really specific target in mind for what you care about and why you want it to be annotated in a certain way, I think means that you often need to have some real supervised data that, that you know is the correct answer. That you don't necessarily have to just rely on interpreting the output of a latent variable model and bringing the entire interpretive apparatus and doing that, or in trying to understand in a more difficult sense what uh, a neural network or a deep learning um, model generally is trying to, is learning about the data. Uh, it's true that it's hard to, it, annotation is expensive, right? It's expensive and it's very time consuming. And it doesn't make sense to do that for every single domain that you care about. One of the things that I generally like to advocate for is that a lot of that work need, just needs to be done by the people who actually care about those domains. So if you're working on Mark Twain, for example, if you're the one who would benefit the most from having a really high quality dependency parser for Mark Twain, then it's often in your own interest for, for, for doing those kind of annotations yourselves. It's, in those kind of cases, though, we get into these other issues of how it is that different annotators agree or disagree on what the correct label is. But I think that's also a strength of this, that in many cases, especially with literary text, there isn't always a correct, a correct answer. That having some, some notion of the variability of what different people think are valid, valid uh, uh, analyses for a given linguistic structure is also meaningful if we can learn a way of mapping between the two. Um, yeah, I had a, I guess a follow up to his question earlier. So, um, books obviously being more complex than Wall Street Journal, I mean, more complex both structurally but as well as, you know, subtext and meaning yep. than Wall Street Journal Newswire. Um, do you think it's possible, like, um, you know, I guess even possible for a, you know, a machine learning algorithm or something to be able to grasp and identify, you know, themes or subtext? Are you know even wordplay from books? You know, like it seemed oh, yeah. the 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 clustering of you know character ar archetypes was sort of in the way, but that's still you know requiring like structures of so and so. You know what you were saying, identifying which words you know 
uh, the exact words you're, with syntax parsing were tied to the characters, whereas, I don't know, these, like, thematically, it's, I guess, not as clear how to pull out the exact words you're looking at. Yeah, so people have done work in this area in trying to apply unsupervised models, like topic models, for example, truly large collections, that, to pull out themes in exactly that sort of sense. And I mean, these are themes that are very broadly defined as being the sort of topical arrangements that, that exist within books that you also bring this interpretive apparatus to. Uh, but there's also been a lot of work, not in, in books, but in other more, um, more generic settings in NLP and trying to recognize metaphor, for example or uh, recognize jokes as they happen. So I mean, this, this gets to a different degree of meaning of, 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 of language that you probably would s encounter a lot more often in figurative text and literary text than you would in the Wall Street Journal. But it's not the only, it doesn't, it's a domain that enough other people are, are interested in with, outside of books that you still see a lot of research effort being directed that way. So two last questions. Okay. Um, so you've described a process right now where you kind of, uh, you go to, literary scholars, you ask them what kinds of predictions your models should be making yep. given people's current understanding of literature, yep. and then you design the models in such a way that they sort of cause those predictions to be made. Yeah. Um, is there even a meaningful sense in which you can kind of do the other thing and actually kind of validate, do science on uh, predictions made by yeah. uh, humanists? Yeah, no, that's, oh, I see, so yeah, so I'm, I'm no, yeah, so there are a couple of different ways I think you can go about doing that, one is by having multiple competing hypotheses about the same phenomenon and seeing how well those, imp those different hypotheses are borne out empirically by data. Uh, it's never going to be the case that you can, I, in my opinion, it's never going to be the case that you can have definitive proof that the data either supports a claim that, uh, that is not necessarily a quantitative claim, inherently quantitative claim, but still is a piece of evidence that can be marshaled in a larger argument, I find. So if, if, if adding empirical evidence is one other piece of the puzzle that a humanist wants to make in, in, in arguing that a specific theory is true or not true, or a specific reading of a text is true or not true, then I think that's, that in itself is, is of value. It doesn't get to exactly the same sort of scientific uh, claims and scientific proof or denials, but it's still at least a step that borrows from some of that methodology. So um, I would like to ask you a question about um, uh, how far do you co do you think that um, uh, the domain of uh, history and the domain of uh, sociology uh, are going to be quantitative? Like, uh, do you think like uh, use the path that you, that you, have sh you have chosen is going to be like uh, systematic for everyone? I, I met a PhD student in uh, history that has to um, read books in Greek and to kind of compute statistics of the world, and since mm -hmm. he's not able to. To, to program in any language. Yeah. So I mean, do you think that uh, uh, there are, I mean, the limitation that you've shown today are for now kind of uh, restrictive to be I mean, widely applied for any history, histor people in history or any grad student in uh, yeah, sociology, but uh, yeah, yes. so I, I think generally these kind of method, these kind of methods are applicable to any kinds of text that you have, and so the the specific uh, disciplinary uh, assumptions that you bring to it are going to guide your choice of whether you want to to apply them or not. Uh, I think generally, though, I I I I, tr I hesitate before to make arguments about where disciplines are going because these things always go in cycles. Uh, now it tends, it seems to be the case that a lot of quantitative approaches are increasing in their uh, attractiveness in, in many of these disciplines, um, but who knows how long it's going to last. And, not, and certainly not everyone is, is, is on that same train. All right, on that note, let's thank our speaker again. And thanks everyone for coming for the great discussion.